Today we have a new guest episode that will no doubt inspire you. Rachel Willis was born into a family with a passion for service. Her passion for children and community has her serving on the Lansing School District and the Community Foundation boards in her free time while serving as VP of Regional Operations at Bethany Christian Services during the day. Join us as we talk life changes, service, and keeping your bucket full. The Speakeasy Podcast, real talk about leadership and sanity in the creative industry. I'm Jen Estel. And I'm Karen Steffel. Managing creativity in business? We probably have an opinion on that. No prohibitions. Clearly, we have cocktails. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So today we're drinking a cocktail. We always start off our episodes with a cocktail. Today it's a mocktail called the Willis. Jen, what's in the Willis? Well, some cool stuff. We named it after Rachel, of course. It's got this really cool Grove 42 seed lip, which is a non-alcoholic spirit, grenadine club soda, and just a little splash of orange juice. It's quite beautiful. It is very beautiful. It's a very kind of intense reddish orange. Yeah, because here's the deal. Uh, Rachel's got a board meeting to go to later, so no booze for her today. <laughs> she has to keep her wits about her. That's right. But you could actually, if you if you wanted to spike this a little bit, you could put throw in a splash of vodka and it wouldn't change the um, the taste at all. But it's a really beautiful little drink. It almost looks like blood orange. Maybe that'll be the, the weekend rendition I'll try. <laughs> There you go. That's a good there idea. You go. So, Rachel, even though we're all having um, quite a 2020, you also had quite a 2019. You made all of your life's changes just to get them over with, right? That's right. Tell us a little bit about what you accomplished in 2019. Yeah, so I figured I would just do all of the major life milestones that I could do in one year. Um, so in 2019, I got married. I had a baby. I bought a house. I got a major promotion at work. I served as president of the Lansing School District Board of Education, and I was chair of the Lansing Regional Community Foundation. Um, And I think the most miraculous thing about 2019 is that I made it to 2020 without (laughs) losing any sort of major, major issues there. I'm still married, still have a baby, still have a house, still have a job. So those are major accomplishments there. So you got all that in. Did you get any sleep in? No, 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 no. So you don't sleep with kids anyway. So that kind of worked to my advantage, um, having a little one that wasn't sleeping very well through that first year. Um, still managed to travel, got my annual stamps and my passport, which was great. Um, and just definitely just was taking the bull by the horns. My parents joke, they said, you found a gas pedal, you put your foot on it all the way to the floor and never took it off. So that's about how 2019 went for me. Well, and I'd imagine you went into 2020 thinking, I'm going to coast for just a minute. And then here we are. <laughs> yes, it's it's funny when um, I was first asked about participating in this uh, podcast, it was pre-COVID. And I was already thinking, um, you know, that BBC interview where the gentleman has his two children come into the to the room during his interview and there was a a mock version that was done with the mother doing the same thing except she like diffuses a bomb during her interview and cooks dinner and changes the baby and gets the diaper that's how my life was normally but I think everyone is sort of experiencing that now with the pandemic and the crisis and working from home and just making major adjustments so it's just been a a, a magic use of every skill that I have to just sort of keep going <laughs> and doing what's required during these times. I did take a little bit of a step back. So I'm vice president of the school board this year, and I am not the chair of the community foundation. I'm still in the executive committee, but not having to run meetings. Um, so that's been helpful and easing a little bit of the stress. However, my work responsibilities have certainly increased, um, not just because of the crisis, but just the scope of the work that I'm I'm doing now. And we'll certainly talk about that in just a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're all using all the skills that we have and even some that we don't. Yeah, I think we really are. Rachel, it's so interesting to hear from you because you and I have been together on a committee or something before. I know that's how that worked, but... I'm always amazed at how much you were carrying last year. There was just so much going on. 
and um, you always seem very cool and calm and like you've got it all handled, which is why we wanted to peek into your brain. <laughs> and how do you do that? <laughs> Yeah. So one of the things that just sort of shapes who I am, that's what somebody's just like describing me of just sort of this breeze that sort of comes in. And my parents told me that when I was younger, they always envisioned me being the lady at the airport that just passed out flowers, wearing like tie dye and my hair all over the place. Cause I've just always sort of had that sort of chill, calm demeanor about me. Um, so every time I, uh, am recognized for doing something or or make some milestone achievement at work. My parents were always like, who? Who are you talking about now? Um, so I Thanks for the just, low confidence. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm thanks, mom and dad. Um, so one of the things that just when I think about just what shaped me and framed me are my parents and just the background that they had and what they've instilled in me. So between my faith and my family, that's really what has shaped me. Um, my parents were raised in two totally different worlds, but met each other at college and were always very family focused and made sure that family was put first. Even so far as when I was younger, there was three of us. I'm in the middle of three children and they would work opposite shifts so that one parent was always home with us in those first couple years um, before we started school because we were all stair steps. So we were all, um, they had like three kids in four years. So we were all pretty close in age. So um, I had my dad grew up with, he grew up on the south side of Chicago with uh, parents who were very heavily involved in their community. So my grandfather um, owned his own business. He owned his own um lab, medical lab, where he did blood samples and testings and worked in different hospitals. My grandmother was a nurse um, for over 50 years and also taught nursing. And they worked very hard, had five kids and a Great Dane and a tiny house on the south side of Chicago. I have no clue how they did it. Um, and we're very... Uh, very big into the civil rights movement. My grandfather actually um, went to the March in Washington in 1963 and then again 50 years later. And it was very much told to us, like, if there's a seat at the table, you 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 join that seat at the table. And it wasn't a matter of of if you will, it was that you will do these things and you will continue to push yourself. And my even going back to my great grandfather on my dad's side of the family, my great grandfather was um, had his PhD in education and was a um, he, he taught at different schools. He taught at Wilberforce University he, and then he taught at Ohio State University um, ultimately before he retired. And so that was just something that education was always very important to us. Going to college was not an option for us. Um, and so uh, even where my parents, my parents met, my mother was the first person in her family to go to college. Um, and she knew that education was very important and she worked jobs all through high school. My mother was actually um, lost both of her parents by the age of 12 um, and was raised by an older sister of hers in Illinois after the age of 12. And was just like, I want better for myself. I want a family and paid her way through college, made to college, and she never stopped either. And so and she was I first just, generation, right? Yeah, she was first generation. And so it's just been amazing to me that, you know, to see my my mother grew up in a house where she had no running water till she was 10 years old. She had, uh, what they had dirt floors, but my mom said they would sweep the dirt floors. She had to walk to school and just, she has so many stories about what she went through as a young lady that she was the person that's like, I walked two miles up hills both ways in the snow to school. And then we always have to call her out. We're like, mom, you lived in Alabama. There was no snow. And she goes, okay, well, there may not have been snow, but it was still uphill both ways. And I was barefoot. So those are always it was probably the 95 degrees had. though. So we'll give her that. 
<laughs> yes, it was hot. Red dirt and clay. My mom grew up in the very deep South. We always say, if you think about the challenges that Selma, Alabama had, just go two hours further into the deep South. And that's where my mom was raised. So, yeah. What a crazy and great story. So you were you were you were raised by people who had a pedigree who which was completely different, but the pedigree still was rich in resilience and determination, and that is what pushed you forward. That's those are the inklings of things that you inherited. Absolutely, that that's definitely a great way to put it. They both, my parents, I just watched them. You know, my dad would work multiple jobs um, and they both went into careers where they were able to work through till their full retirement and just said, hey, kids, keep going. And thankfully, I just had that support to just keep going. And I also sometimes I blame my sister. So I'm a middle child and my sister got all so you have to blame your sister for a lot of things. Exactly. My sister got all A's in school. So my parents would look at me. They were like, okay, your sister did it. I'm like, come on. C's get degrees. This is fine. But it didn't work out that way. I was still kind of (laughs) pushed to (laughs) continue to achieve, which has helped. But even as a young woman, when you, when your parents moved to Lansing, your dad was in law school, right? And your mom decided to, again, get that seat at the table, right? So that like, that desire to have a seat at the table, a voice, and to serve was right there for her. Yeah. So my dad, when he first moved to Michigan, he actually lived at the YMCA um, for a while and then would go home to Illinois every weekend where my mother and sister were. And then when my mom became pregnant with me, she was like, okay, I should probably live in the same state as my husband. Um, so she moved to Lansing. Um, and I, so I was born here. I was the first person in my family that was born here in Lansing. And my mom just started saying, okay, well, i am got to make this place home. Where do I do that? And she just started joining board after board. And she started at the Y. She started doing things at the county. Um, I joke with my parents that they've never met a stranger in their life. Like they're the people that strike up conversations in the checkout line, at the car wash, in the drive through light. Like, what are you doing? It's okay to just do the polite wave and keep going, but not my parents. So um, even my niece, who's now eight years old, she's picked up on it and they'll go, she'll go places with my parents and she'll tell them, Ma, she'll tell them it's not, they're strangers. Okay. You do know we don't talk to strangers <laughs> because they just talk to anyone. Um, so that's just, yeah, my, I just watched my mom just make these relationships with folks. And so that was just my normal Um to just strike up these conversations and engage with people and and just have an act of service. And just going back to my my extended family, you know, my grandma was uh, head of the Black Nurses Association in Chicago. So when even when we would go visit my grandma, she would take us places on the weekends. We'd go to different uh, workshops or events or meetings. And it's funny, years later, we still meet people that knew us as little kids because they remember my grandma toting us along with her to different events over the weekend. So, Who are you more like, your mother or your father? Oh, my gosh. I, I think it depends on the day. Um, I can definitely be emotional as my mother, but I have the the internal thought processes of my father. So it just sort of depends on uh, which part of my brain I'm operating in <laughs> during that when time. You're, when you're going through a professional crisis, who do you call first? Oh, you know. Don't get it, in trouble, com- Karen. <laughs> It completely depends uh, because both of my parents have different areas where they excelled, right? So my dad definitely um, had higher achievements in his professional career, but on the public facing work, my mother um, made more strides there. So um, one of the things that's really neat is uh, Sarah Anthony has created, our state representative Sarah Anthony has created a, a calendar called Seat at the Table. And she invited my mother and I to be part of the 2020 calendar. And she featured us in the month of May for Mother's Day in recognition of Mother's Day. And that was just one of the things that my mother and I were going through that um, 
going through that experience of being featured in that calendar was just figuring out all the ways that were similar, but then all the ways that my mother taught me things and how I took that and put my own spin on them. So that's just been great to just have my parents so close by and be able to interact with them and have them to lean on for support. So you're our calendar girl this month is what you're telling us. Yes, I am. That's kind of exciting. Thank you. (laughs) If I can make it back to my office to actually flip my calendar in the next few days, that would be great. (laughs) I'm curious. I don't even know how to, I don't even know, I don't even know where to go because I'm so curious right now. In in listening to your story, my thoughts have gone a lot of places. Um, How could the rest of our community foster that legacy of service like you are doing? And how have you planned for your daughter to try to figure out what her legacy might look like or what you might impart into her world? Yeah. You know, as I was thinking about this, it's really about your individual balance and what, what drives you, right? So as much as I do a lot and I seem like I'm checking a lot of achievement boxes, I still try to make sure that I take time for me and do things that are important to me. So one thing that has allowed me to excel so well, as I mentioned, is my family. I'm very close to my family in both proximity and emotional relationships. And so I just sort of have that place to go if I need to unwind and have people really see me, you know, sort of mask off, if you will, um, and just have people that really understand what's important to me so that they can help support me where I where I need to be pushed, but then also support me to take some time um, back and recover for myself, right? Like that whole idea that you can't pour from an empty bucket. I'm also, you know, one of the other hats that I wear is I'm a licensed social worker. So mental health is very important to me. And so just recognizing when you may need that time to get that professional support and just really, reducing the stigma around that. And it's okay to cry uncle and say when you need help and just have that time to to reach out to a mental health professional and have that release and um, interaction. I I definitely support that. And it's some, some advice that I've taken in my own world as a way to just sort of help when that, things can be overwhelming. Um, and not comparing yourself to other people as well. Like I had as you know, during the COVID crisis, working through video conferences and being at home, I had someone say to me, like, I don't know how you do it. Um, Just the, I had been on um, a news segment or something in the recent days prior to me being on this call. And I finally said, I, I turned my camera around. I was like, my child is wearing her nighttime diaper on the floor, eating French fries off the floor right now. Like, it's okay to say everything's maybe not as great as uh, you may think it is. So I think that just taking the time to just recognize where things that if you like it, go for it. And if you need some time to take a step back, that's okay too. I definitely have, you know, I love traveling. So I always make sure that I'm intentional about taking time out to travel and just shutting off when I can. Um, Those are things that I definitely try to do with intentionality. Thank you for that. I think we all need to hear a lot of those notes. Um, I think mental health awareness can't be said enough, um, especially with the crisis that this world is going through, this country, our community is going through, um, but also that, hey, kids are going to lead the charge and do what they're going to do. If you're going to try to not pay attention to them and get something else done, they're definitely going to eat something off the floor. Right. <laughs> definitely. Let's talk a little bit about your own service, stepping into your own service, but even how do you view your, your, your day job as a role of service? And um, how's that going for you (laughs) these times? So my day job, I work with children and families um, through a variety of of ways. So the main umbrella of child and family service that I work in is in child welfare. 
So that's working with children that are in foster care or children that are available for adoption through a variety of ways, whether that's through um, having their parental rights terminated through the foster care system or domestic infant adoptions, which are direct release placements. Um, think about uh, safe delivery releases, infant adoptions, and then also intercountry adoptions to a very small um a very small degree. We do a little bit of inter international adoption work. So um, also working with unaccompanied children and refugees and families that are resettling to the U.S. So um, it's kind of a broad scope of programming that I work in. And so each program experiences crises in different ways, right? So if you think back to the summer of 2000. 18, um, when we had the border crisis and then bleeding that into 2019, um, just working with um, children and families that were experiencing crises in their home countries and um, and fleeing to the U.S., working with children and families that are uh, being resettled from refugee camps and entering the U.S., just the scope and number of unaccompanied children, so children that are entering this country of all ages and they're alone and helping them find their families or sponsors. Um, and then plus we have the unfortunate number of children that are experiencing abuse and neglect. So in the state of Michigan at any given time, there's over 12,000 children that are not with their families. So they're in foster care or adoptive home or in congregate care settings. So that would be um, residential facilities or other type of treatment facilities. So there's a large uh, sort of community that operates around supporting those children and families all the time. I can't even listen to you talk about it without crying. So I don't know how you do your job. Yeah, I have been in this career for 10 years now. Um, and when I started, I never imagined where it would take me. But I uh, like just recently reached, uh, had a family reach out to me and it was the first adoption case that I ever did. Um, and this family actually ended up adopting two children and their request to me was um, the agency that I work for, which is Bethany Christian Services, has such a major impact on their lives and their family's life that they wanted to give back, especially during this time of crisis. And so that to me are the type of things that sort of keep me going. Um, one of the things that's just been a major area of concern it's just during this crisis, we worry about the children and families that are not seen, right? So with schools being closed and access to a lot of services being significantly impacted, we worry about the kids that aren't able to get meals or not able to get the services that they need, that they rely on, um, whether that's occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, even though we're doing modifications and adjustments as we can, we know it's not to the extent that a lot of our children and families need. So just sort of helping them meet uh, the needs of their, their families the best way that we can, but just knowing that as things start to reopen, that we'll see a, a, an, an increase in um, potential referrals into the system um, to be able to assist children and families. So that's just something that we are preparing for even during this sort of slow time um, of working from home and staying at home. And I think probably the um, the increase in stress and concern that economic concern and, and um, emotional stress that people are under, um, the amount of domestic abuse that we know that is increased during times of crisis means that the child welfare system is probably going to be flooded when the courts open back up. Yeah, and that's something that it's definitely unfortunate, but it's a um, an aspect of our community and our society that's always, always, always sort of always going on. Um, so I started in my career in child welfare before I started my sort of public service outward facing. Um, work. And that's definitely sort of what drove me to at least starting with running for the school board was that I've always sort of been interested in the continuum of care for kids. So I actually started when I went to college, I wanted to be a pediatrician. And I was like, okay, that's a point in care and in time when you know I, I know I can care for somebody. So eventually people go to the doctors, all kids go to the pediatrician, even when they're healthy. So this is a point in time when I know I can care for kids. And when I was going through my medical programming, um, the medical uh, 
curriculum required that we take a social work course. And when we took our first social work course, my life changed. I could not, I was like, there's a whole nother set of spectrum of services that need help um, in this world. And I was like, I'm going to get in, in in a different spot on this stream, right? Like I working in the medical field is one spot on the tra- stream and social work is all in that same stream. And so I decided to move upstream a little bit in my area of service. But I never lost sight of, you know, sort of the policy aspects that impacts the work that our children and families need. And so that's sort of what drove me to the school board. My mother was on the school board for eight years um, when I was still in school. And at the time that I joined the school board, it was in 2011 is when I ran And the schools were facing a significant amount of economic crisis. Um, Enrollments were uh, very much declining in the area. And I was like, I think I had a wonderful experience in the Lansing School District. Let me join and see what I can do to help. And that's where it just started. There was a vacancy and I applied. I did not get the uh, appointment during the vacancy, but that fall there was three seats open. And I was challenged by a member of the community to run, and I did, and I feel like I just never looked back. Um, So that's just been a great uh, component of my life, just being able to live sort of in both worlds. So I feel like during my day job, I don't even call it nine to five, but it's the the job that moderately pays my bills as a social worker. Um, I'm on one aspect of the continuum, and then in the evenings and any other time that I have available, I'm working in the education aspect of the continuum. And then that certainly fit my calling when there became a call to be on the Community Foundation Board, um, Mm -hmm. that that's another aspect of the continuum and benevolent benevolent giving um, to the community, that that was someplace else that I could see some value in being engaged. So that's sort of what drives me. Like when I look at where to spend my time, it's around where I can continue to give back and hit that that need for serving children and families in the community. And I, I think when we were speaking before um, before our recording date, we were talking about how do you know when, when so much is coming at you and there's so much community need, and whether that's during the nine to five, your day job, or whether it's in your roles and service, and there's so many needs and you can't kind of fill them all, how do you know what the right answer is? And I think you said something like, you always go back to where you're going to make the biggest impact with children. Right. And I just feel like that's a very easy guiding principle for you, that there's just this, there's this line that you might have to weave back and forth around it, but... To get right. there, but you're still kind of always towing that line. Yeah, that's definitely the, the line that I sort of look at as my area of expertise. And then there's other area of expertise needed. You know, sometimes I forget about the business aspect or other, maybe the elderly population. And so I just make sure that I'm surrounding myself with other individuals that can speak into those other lines and then just um, focusing on my area of expertise, which is children and families. I will say that Lansing's probably pretty lucky to have you. My goodness. (laughs) Yes. Thanks for watching out for our stuff (laughs) and our kids. I do what I can. I want my my little one to have every opportunity that I have. I mean, Lansing's just a great place. Um, It's so incredibly diverse and just... From the manufacturing work that we have to the farming community that's close by to the diversity in our schools to the diversity in the in the population, it's just it's absolutely incredible. Even my husband is from the east side of the state and he's from the Detroit area. And whenever he comes here, he's like, it is a totally different world here than in the Tri-County area and near Detroit. So I love it here. It's pretty cool. All right. I have one I have one more question for you. And I think it it might be well timed because we've been sort of in a crisis mode, but I know through both your work and your board service, you have been in crisis mode before. So give us some tips. How do you handle all that? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So it's funny that you mentioned the word crisis because it's hard not to hear that and get triggered and start to go into your flight, fright flight, fight or freeze mode, um, which I think a lot of us are sort of getting pushed into during this this uh, crisis around COVID, just when you start to think about wanting to protect yourself um, and your family. But I always try to take a pause and take a step back and not 
um, go to that primitive part of the brain first. And so I have sort of a, if I start to feel my heart race or my brain not think rational thought, I can sort of remind myself, okay, you're literally not in your right mind. Like the part of your brain that needs to make rational decisions is not functioning right now. Um, yeah. And so just taking a step back and then going back to that, uh, that base, right. Of my family being there to sort of bounce things off of, to just sort of recall, there have been some extremely challenging times in the past year, year and a half that I faced across all of the commitment areas that I'm in charge of, whether it's been work or school board. Um, and so just trying to take a step back and remember, okay, where do I want to see things turn out, right? So not always worrying about responding in that immediate crisis, but thinking about where do we want things to be at the end of the day? Um, and if you can just sort of take that step back, then you can see things from the bigger picture. And so that's what I, that's what I try to do. By no means am I perfect at it, but <laughs> this is definitely one of those I say, this is my advice now, whether I can actually do it and do it well, that's a different question. You didn't ask that question, Jen. So No, I didn't ask that question. <laughs> we're all practicing all the time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And like I said earlier, when you were talking about using your best skills, sometimes we're using skills that aren't quite, quite as honed as they uh, some of our other skills are. And so, you know, we're all doing the best that we can, but, but knowing to pause and knowing when you're uh, not using the logic side of your brain, but using that reptilian part of your brain. Yeah, that's a good, fairly useful. It's a good thing to notice. So, what's on the docket for the rest of 2020? <laughs> so, there's just you know, when I think about the community focused area, you know, when I started 2020, and my focus on the school board was we were looking for a new superintendent um, and just adjusting. This is one of those things, okay, where we had to adjust to a crisis. So we made a little bit of a pivot. Um, I'm really just cons not necessarily concerned, but being very intentional around looking at what education will look like in the fall for our children and families that are going to be coming back to school after a very long break in face-to-face -face education. And making sure that we're prepared to meet the needs of our families and children when that face-to-face uh, -face education resumes in the fall. And then still working on um, securing our superintendent um, in place so that we have a leader moving us forward. And then... Um, in the, in the personal work-life balance, um, my goal is to just continue to raise my little one and watch her grow and thrive. That has been uh, sort of the bittersweet part of being home is that I'm able to see her and see her take her first steps and not miss out on some milestones that I may have otherwise missed out on from being at work or having my commute or something like that. So I just have a lot of positive things that I'm keep me that help me sleep at night when otherwise the crisis would help keep me up at night. So just trying to balance the positive things that are, are possible to look forward to. Yeah. I think I am I'm truly hopeful that even amid all the heartbreak and um, sadness that people are going through, that there's something on the other side that is better for us all in terms of the way that we operate and that we um, relate to one another and that we value. Thank you very much, Rachel. It's been so great to hear your story. It's so interesting to me. I, I love how you said your parents put it, that you found the gas pedal and you pushed it all the way down. And it's nice to see somebody come out of a year like that still inspired. So that's kind of nice. Oh, thank you. And I thank you guys so much for having me. I was certainly humbled by the request to participate in this podcast. I know that... Th you guys have interviewed so many inspiring people that just have a story to share. And so if my story has just helped anyone or inspired them or just to help to maybe get them know, get to know me better or want to know more about what they can do to help in the community, then I'm, I'm happy as long as it's helping other people. And <laughs> Karen raises her hand. As long as it's helping other people and just letting them know that there's there's people out there that, that do this every day. Um, we just look at the 
I, I said this earlier, just the everyday heroes that have come out of this crisis that we never would have thought to recognize. The folks working at the drive throughs the folks working at the stores, the custodial staff that are still helping the hospitals keep going, the first responders, the social workers, the teachers, the stay-at-home moms that all of a sudden became teachers or parents. I mean, all of those things that just have helped the community sort of say, hey, we're all in this and we got to work together. That's what it's all about to me. And my niece is eight years old and she saw a commercial recently and it it was how we're all in this together. And if you've seen the things going around on the social media about putting hearts on windows so people can drive by. My niece made signs that said, we're, we're here together to put up Mm -hmm. on them because that's what inspired her. And so I just think about, Hey, if that can spark uh, the heart of a babe, then it can spark the hearts of lots of people. So I just really appreciate you having me on here to share a little bit about my story. Oh, we're so honored. Thanks much, Rachel. It's great. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you liked it, share it with a friend. So, Jen, what are we talking about next time? You know, every business has to evolve as a natural reaction to change. But what about when that change hits you like a freight train? Or like a pandemic. Right. Join us next time as we talk about lessons learned through a new way of working, what's on the other side, and how to peer into your business evolution crystal ball. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next time. Cheers.